Most of my work before I, after I was, after I worked in AIDS for five years, I went to the Food and Drug Administration. And most of my work before I went to the FDA had been uh, in, in areas of serious disease, cancer and AIDS, where once, once you have, um, once you have a known treatment that's known to be life-saving or prevent cancer relapse, you don't do placebo-controlled trials or trials with a no-treatment control. But at the FDA, I learned that there were you know, many other kinds of trials. We have lots of drugs that are not life-saving drugs, but are very valuable drugs. If you have allergic rhinitis and you spend uh, all day long, you know, blowing your nose, um, that, and, and then suddenly there's a drug that can control that, uh, that's a big quality of life factor, and that is a very important drug for you to have. Uh, but, um, but there's nothing, um, you know, but, but, but your life is not at stake if you are in a placebo-controlled trial of a new drug for allergic rhinitis. Um, a problem in doing clinical trials of many of those kinds of drugs, drugs that relieve symptoms but don't, don't have an impact on fundamental health, is that the results are very, very variable for reasons that people haven't figured out. Drugs that everybody believes work, um, if you do five or six trials, you will find it, it seems not to work in some of those trials. And, and nobody has really figured out why. It's true for drugs, uh, well, and any symptom relieving drug, pain drugs, uh, allergic rhinitis drugs, antidepressants. It's a, it's a sort of a well-known phenomenon. So a problem there is if you want to compare a new drug for allergic rhinitis against an existing drug for allergic rhinitis, and they come out to be the same, you can't necessarily conclude that the new drug is working because that drug, that the, the drug that you think works might not have been working in that trial. Why? Maybe for some reason the people in that trial, it was a, there weren't a lot of allergens around during the time that they were in the trial, or it, it's, it's, it's hard to know. But because it's very common for trials of this sort to be negative, even when there's a known uh, effective treatment mm -hmm. involved, um, the FDA has learned not to trust active control trials. So they insist for these kinds of trials on at least a placebo. Their optimal design is a placebo and an active control and the new drug. That way, if the new drug doesn't do better than placebo, but the active drug doesn't do better than placebo either, you know that you've got a failed trial. If the drug that you know works is better than placebo, but the new drug isn't better than placebo, then you start to get a clue that maybe this new drug is not effective. But you need the placebo as an anchor, otherwise you don't know where you are. So the question is, is it unethical to do a trial? You have an existing treatment, and, um, and is it unethical to do, uh, to do a trial with a placebo control? And I think uh, when, when people started to raise this, it was a surprise to people at the FDA because it wouldn't have occurred to them to think there's anything unethical about telling somebody who is has a symptom to that there's a clinical trial they might get a placebo um, uh, the new drug might or might not work uh, new drug might have some side effects um, we just want to see if it works you'll be on this for these are usually short-term trials maybe two to six weeks uh, you can get go off the trial anytime you want so for example if somebody you know, is really having bad symptoms and they just can't stand it anymore, they just go off the trial. Didn't seem unethical. Nobody's fundamental health is being risked. But, uh, but there were also uh, a big, in the news at that, this time, this was the late 1990s, were um, AIDS trials in developing countries that were utilizing placebos because the regimens that they were testing were very simplified regimens compared to what had been shown to be effective in the U.S. And the NIH and the CDC, who were sponsoring these trials, were concerned that these the simplified regimens might not work at all. The more complex regimens that were used in the United States um, were not implementable in these developing countries. Uh, in particular, these are trials of mother-to-child mother transmission of HIV that involved starting the mother on antiviral drugs, on AZT, uh, you know, partway through her pregnancy. Uh, in the U.S., people come in for prenatal visits. In many areas in the developing countries, that was not feasible. You would not get to the woman until uh, until she was it was time to give birth, and so nobody was sure that it would work at all. And AZT was a 
you know, not a trivial drug. Nobody, you know, knew for sure what it was going to do to developing children. Even after it had been successful in the U.S. in preventing transmission, we didn't know whether there weren't going to be side effects down the road uh, in the children. So those trials were originally designed as placebo-controlled trials to see whether, in fact, the and the, these were going to have any effect. But there was a huge uh, uproar about that and whether those trials were ethical. So that fed into this whole debate about placebo-controlled trials. And I think people thinking about babies infected with AIDS in developing countries, they didn't want to think about people on two-week trials for allergic rhinitis. They just wanted a rule that said you can't use a placebo if there's, if there's an existing drug. They just, they just didn't want to hear anything else. And in fact, the Declaration of Helsinki uh, was modified to say exactly that. There was, there was so much controversy over this. Now, eventually that was rolled back, and the Declaration of Helsinki now says basically what most people who have really thought about this believe, that um, it's not ethical to use a placebo if you are, you know, if, if the drug that, if there's an existing drug that's known to save life or prevent really bad things from happening. But it's okay in the cases of, you know, but the it's drug okay. that's known to stop a stuff. That, 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 that's right. That's right. So, so, so anyway, this was a long process, and I was involved in, in uh, giving talks. I'm sure I gave one at Primer um, about this. I probably was involved in a debate about it. Um, I wrote papers with, uh, with FDA colleagues that, that appeared and explained what the issues were, tried to explain the difficult, the scientific difficulties in being able to draw conclusions about an effective drug um, when you didn't have a, a placebo arm. There were many people who were saying, well, if you, you know, if you've already got an, if you've already got an effective drug for allergic rhinitis, say, then the only thing we want is a better drug. Why would we care about another drug that's just as good? If it's better, then you don't have any interpretive problems, and that's right. But there's ways to be better other than um, being more effective. You can be better by having fewer side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so, for example, we may have had effective antihistamines, but they were sedating, make you sleepy. That's not so great. You may not want to be sneezing and blowing your nose all day, but you don't want to be half asleep all day either. So the creation of non-sedating antihistamines was a huge step forward for people who had allergic rhinitis. Now, these, these, um, these antihistamines were no more effective than the sedating antihistamines. In fact, maybe they were even a little less effective. Who knows? But, you know, people who needed this, this was really, this was really great. But you couldn't have determined whether it was effective at all. Without uh, without a placebo control, right. so so th this was something to explain. And there were people I will tell you, who were like this. You know, don't tell me. I just know it's unethical. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear any arguments. Uh, I went to a lot of meetings where there were people like that. But ultimately, ultimately, people did hear. At least enough people did hear, and the declaration moved back. And I think we're we're pretty much back to where we were.